Okay, the material we're going to cover today, again, like yesterday evening's class, not exactly on the Torah portion. I know we covered several topics in Shemot in the cycle last year, and I think last night we talked more about the Torah portion after class than we did during the recorded part of the class. And um, we can do that today if you'd like to spend a little more time in the Torah portion after class. Uh, but I wanted to get into, really kind of put some of this introductory material in workbook two behind us. And I think you're kind of getting the message because it hasn't changed much, is that in order to serve Yeshua, in order to serve the Father, there's no way around that tribulation. Um, I know we... We investigated all sorts of ways, probably if we were in the church. We like to read the books that told us that we wouldn't have to go through the Great Tribulation, that you know things just weren't going to be that way, that we were special, and we were going to be floating on a cloud while those rascally Jews finally accepted Yeshua as the Messiah. But I can't make that work from the scriptures, from what is written. In fact, I come up with something much different. But a lot of those things are future. We won't know them until they happen. Some things are for today. Um, and that's what it says. You know, the secret things are for God, but the revealed things are for us and our children to walk out. And what is really clear in Scripture is that to follow that path of a righteous life, and we talked about that path yesterday because we, we compared the wicked lamp to the holy lamp, especially as the ultimate destination for those on the path of the wicked lamp, the ultimate destination is separation. And for those on the path of righteousness, the ultimate destination is Shabbat and gathering with like kind and like mind. That's, that's a very different uh, destination for each of us. One, separation from the body of Messiah, and two, gathering with the body of Messiah. And what we're doing right now is practicing. What we're doing is we're cutting in behaviors. And we talked about with the wicked heart, the word that um, describes the, the heart that devises wicked plans, that word for devises is like it's cutting them in. And that's how we do a behavior. We do it once, we do it twice, we do it three times, we do it four times, and we're wearing the path. And you can see that when people take shortcuts across your lawn, do you know it? Of course you do, because you can see where the grass has been worn down in the places where they take their shortcuts. We always know where the path is. And it takes time. And it takes repetition. So the way, Uzi, the way that we're behaving today, we're conducting ourselves today, or even the way that we process our thinking about certain topics, certain subjects, that's also being cut into our hearts. Because we're framing those situations that way over and over and over and over to the point that should I ever recognize that this is not a good way of thinking? And therefore, it's not a good way of behaving because the behaving is based on wrong thinking. So, and like we said last night, you can go to therapy all you want, and all they're really going to do probably is help you think and understand your problem, understand the source of your problem with the idea that if you only understood why you were doing what you were doing, then you would change what you were doing. But it doesn't work like that. Once that path is cut in, like it's telling us with the, the heart of the wicked lamp, which is a heart that devises wicked plans, when that behavior has been cut in over and over and over, it matters not if you know why you're doing it, if you keep doing it. You might know why you're an alcoholic, but if you keep drinking, it doesn't change the behavior. You might recognize, 
I am an alcoholic, which I'm not, but, <laughs> um, but knowing why you do something does not change the fact that you're still doing it. Why? Because you've cut the pathway. You've taken that shortcut for so many times. It's hard to change the behavior. And ultimately, those wrong ways of thinking lead to those wrong ways of doing, which lead to the wrong destination, which is separation from the body of Messiah. And Shabbat is our weekly practice. Every Shabbat, we get to practice cutting in to our hearts the proper behavior. And like we said last night, don't tell me you love Adonai if you don't love your neighbor. You can't tell me that. I won't believe you. You could tell me. I just won't believe you. If you tell me you love your neighbor, but you don't love Adonai, I still won't believe you. I can't believe you when you say you love one and not the other, or that you hate one and not the other. Those, everything hangs on those two things. And so as we get into some of this material, I want to quote again from the Pirkei Avot. We were studying these portions earlier this week, and um, I did a little bit of additional research because I really wanted to understand what it was saying. Sometimes the, the rabbinic commentary is very cryptic, and we don't always get exactly where they're taking that from. Like, where did they get that idea? And is it actually scriptural? And if you start researching where did they get that idea, then it starts to make sense because this saying, which is, and here's the saying, do not separate yourself from the community. Period. Well, it's not really a period. It goes on. There's other stuff in the saying, but that's the part I wanted to focus on. It says, do not separate yourself from the community. And it doesn't tell you why. And I want to know, why not? Why can't we all just go off and do our own thing? Well, part of that we already know. Just like if we see a seagull flying over the Arizona desert, we know that seagull is not long for this world. Because not only has he left like kind and like mind, he's left his feeding places, he's left his breeding places, he's left his resting places. He's completely left the environment that was designed to keep him alive. Now, that's not to say that he wouldn't have been pecking on other members of his flock if he were on the seacoast. Birds tend to do that. They tend to peck and fight over territory. But when you pull that seagull completely out of his community, it's just a matter of time when he dies because he's not suited for the Arizona desert. He wasn't designed for it. And human beings were not designed to be alone. From the beginning, we get that paleo prophecy. It's not good for man or any human being to be alone. Because when you're left alone with your own thoughts, you will eventually go down that path of devising wicked plans. And the way that you devise them is you start framing them to make them comfortable. You start making the things that you want to do okay, and you might even use scripture to support it. But if you take the whole scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you realize that you were designed and you were created to be part of a community. And that's what the rabbi says. Um, and this is chapter four of the Pirkei Avot. Um, Don't separate yourself from the community. And we know the seventh abomination is one who separates brothers. In fact, not only is he a separatist, he separates others from the community. And this is the most abominable thing in the eyes of the Father. So that was what I wanted to research. And a lot of times this separation occurs, and that's why I want to tie it back into workbook two. We can hit a snag within our community 
where it's causing us distress and stress. I don't know if distress and stress are the same thing, but they sound pretty much alike. So we'll just say we're stressed and distressed by our community. Remember the pecking birds? <laughs> They're all pecking because they all want to sit on the same place on the telephone wire. It doesn't mean you won't, you know, be hen pecking or rooster pecking, <laughs> whatever goes on within your community. You will. The difference is those arguments and disagreements are occurring where you're supposed to be. Because those are the tests, those are the tribulations that are designed to bring you to that gathering place of Shabbat. That's part of the tribulation that we have to suffer in order to grow a healthy community. And human beings typically do not like to go through the stress and the distress with like kind and like mind in order to obtain that healthy community. And a lot of times it's because we're thinking, how in the world will we ever grow anything healthy out of this argument? This is a nowhere place, right? This is a dead end. We're just going around in circles here. But that's being very short-sighted. We have to be long-sighted. We have to be spiritually sighted. We have to lift our eyes and become a dumb. And we'll talk about the three different kinds of person, the Adam, the Ish, and the Enosh, and the difference among those three. Because most of the times we conduct ourselves on the level of Ish, man. But we want to rise to the level of Adam, because that's the spiritual man, the one that really reaches for the heavens because he understands that he's in that image. And what happens is the Ish often does not want to pay the price to become the Adam, to perfect that, to perfect his name. See, we're all given a name in the world, and that's the part of the Torah portion I really... Um, think I want to bring out within the lesson, Shemot means names. In scripture, names are important. How many Hebrew roots people do you know have taken on Hebrew names? Because they wanted something to define them, something that would proclaim who they were in a better way than whatever name they were given. And a Shem, a name, and I'm on page 12 of Workbook 5, Volume 2, is that it has a definition. Shem, we translate that as name, but it also means your reputation. It can mean your fame. It can mean your glory. It can be a memorial, how people remember you, or even a monument. Um... There are famous names in history. We don't forget them because they hold a place in history. They hold a place in our memory. There's something of significance about that name. I mean, we even name diseases after people. Now, would you want to be named after a disease? <laughs> Please don't name a disease after me. Uh, but you see that. And... So your name is not just this label that's placed on you, like there's eggs in this carton. What's your name? My name is Eggs. Well, not really. That's what you are, but it's not who you are. What is your real identity? What is your reputation? That's what a name gives. And what we have here is... Um, Another aspect of a name that we get from the Strong's Concordance is it means a definite and a conspicuous position. In other words, people know who you are. In fact, in the Proverbs, it says even a child is known by his actions. So even a little child who hasn't attained a, an age of accountability, we already know that reputation of that child based on what? His behavior. The things that come out of his mouth. If he's a little smart aleck and he's smarting off to adults, that child has already earned 
a reputation. Now he might outgrow it through discipline and so forth, but to those who have heard that child be disrespectful to adults, he already has a reputation. But what if he is respectful? Um, I like that when you get farther down south, especially places like Louisiana, you never hear an older person addressed by his name. If you're younger than that person, then you never just call him by his first name or her first name. Like my mother's name was Bobby. Anyone younger than her called her Miss Bobby. And when I go visit down there, people that are younger than me will call me Miss Elisa. And that's just a sign of respect that I don't want to be too familiar. This is a social convention that says we do give respect to those who are older than we are, which is a very biblical concept. So your name is your reputation. It gives you that conspicuous position. It is your fame. And in, you know, hopefully it is your glory because the deeds that you do that are associated with your name, then those are the things that are actually giving glory to Elohim. Now, that reflection of honor does come on you. In fact, the more Torah that is in you, the more you're respected. That's another saying of the, the Pirkei Avot, is that the more Torah that is embedded in you as a person, the more honor you have. You're, you're like a walking Torah scroll, and people should respect that within you. So the more they see you behaving Torah, the more they understand that you do have a conspicuous position within your community or your family, and they should honor and respect God's word that's in you, and it's cut in so deeply into your heart, it's being manifested in your behavior. People watch us make choices, and when they see the choices we make, that earns us a reputation. And so we are Shemot, we are names in Israel. And we're either bringing glory to Elohim or we're bringing dishonor to his name. That's why I'm so rigid when it comes to things like Facebook and the types of things that people post in, on social media. Don't ever post something that's going to bring shame to the name of Yeshua or the Father. And those things happen a lot of times when we don't think, before we say or before we write or type, we become angry before we write or we speak, or we become sad, disgusted. Those expressions of the nefesh, they're very strong. And we end up writing things or saying things when we're in a highly emotional state. And in that case, it's much more likely that you're expressing something from the level of Enosh than from the level of Adam. Because your, your Ish, your Ish man is kind of stuck in the middle. In fact, let me write those for you. Uh, you've got Adam, Ish, which is trying to fix my spelling and say wish, and Enosh, and no, it's not noshing, although Enosh does like to nosh. And so with Adam, you've got spiritual man. With Ish, then he's going to be less spiritual, intermediate. And with Enosh, he's the mortal. Okay, so that's kind of the difference among the three. When you hear Adam, or if you're reading it in Hebrew and you see Adam, you know that in context, usually it's going to refer to the, the more noble, you know, a man with a name or a woman with a name, Shemot, that conspicuous position. Why? Because they're behaving in such a way that they are reaching toward the heavens in their behavior their behavior is going to be much more spiritual. When you see enosh used in scripture, as if you were to do a word search, 
you would see that frequently enosh is going to apply to a person who's considered a mere mortal, somebody who's going to die and to decay. It's somebody that identifies more with the right here, the right now, but these are things that die. And we talked about how much competition has entered into our daily life and it's excessive and it's not really teaching the heart of the Torah. It's teaching us to compete with one another. It's teaching us to de defeat one another. And it's teaching us to devalue or to value others. And then I had to confess to last night's class, I was watching the Oklahoma game right up until class started. <laughs> My poor uncle flew all the way from Atlanta to the Rose Bowl because he just knew the Sooners were going to beat Georgia. And as it turns out, uh, <laughs> he flew a long way for nothing. <laughs> um, but at least in the United States, and I think the same is true in other countries, because I think they're just as crazy about what we call soccer, they call football, as we are about football and basketball. Um, we've gone nuts when it comes to sports, because that spirit of competition, um, it's really driving us. And so you have people trying to make their shem, their name, with their physical ability. We also have people who are trying to make their shem or their name by misusing the Torah. In other words, to use the Torah to crown themselves. Remember, what does Adam do? He is that more spiritual man, but he reaches for the heavens because he knows he is to reflect the glory of Elohim on this earth. It's not for him to keep. And that, as you keep reading where it says, do not separate yourself from the community, it says, do not make the Torah a crown for self-glorification. In other words, it shouldn't be in your mind to have the best uh, videos, Torah videos, to have the ultimate Torah newsletter going out every week, to be the most sought after conference speaker, um, to teach the Midrash more often in your, your local congregation, to have the Facebook page that people turn to because you're, you always believe you're posting the, the best research and so forth. And it's not really bringing glory to Elohim. It's glorifying you and it's building your kingdom so that when you compare yourself to so-and-so's ministry or to so-and-so's Facebook page or when so-and-so leaves the Midrash, that I'm better than he is or I'm better than she is. That's a complete abuse and misuse of the Torah. And you're sinking with that type of mentality and eventually you will separate people. You may not mean to, but if that's the seventh abomination, that's ultimately the level to which you will fall. You will fall to the level of mortality, which is what Adam and Eve did. These lofty, spiritual and physical beings fell and they became mere mortals. The, the decay of death set in and all of a sudden now they've got a shelf life. They won't live forever. And I looked at the commentary on this admonition that we should not separate ourselves from the community. And I understand a lot of people simply don't have one. I mean, for some people, this is it. Uh, there's just nobody close enough to fellowship with without completely violating the spirit of Shabbat, which is to rest um, and to cease from your occupation and not to conduct commerce. So if you would have to drive so far that you'd have to stop and gas up and pay for gas and eat somewhere, then you might be actually violating some things of Shabbat in order to find that community. Ultimately, 
how do you resolve that? <laughs> well, you're either going to have to make your own community, which means you're going to have to start recruiting for people to study with on Shabbat and the fellowship. And the main thing is on Shabbat, it's a meal and it's Torah study. Those are really the two biggies. When you look at scripture, once we just take for granted, you're not going to be out working on the job. Okay, now I'm resting. What do I do? Typically involves a meal. You see even Yeshua going, you know, and visiting places being invited for meals. That's customary. And reading the Torah. Not necessarily in a deep way on Shabbat. The, the really deep study you would do Sunday through Friday. But the more uplifting aspect, just like with your, your Shemone Yisrei, on Shabbat, it's shortened. It's, there's more brevity within the prayer. You labor harder on issues like repentance with the daily prayers on the other six days of the week, but you keep it more uplifting on Shabbat. And so your Torah study should be more uplifting on Shabbat. Torah study on Shabbat is not for you to debate conspiracy theories and, and politics and those sorts of things. It's to be uplifting, it's to be encouraging, and it's to find those life lessons in the Torah portion that we can encourage one another with in the community. Because if we're coming into the community and we're being encouraged, we're being encouraged while we're there, then what's happening? We're creating favorable conditions for those birds to fly back to that same spot next Shabbat. But if these birds are flying in on Shabbat and they're constantly being bombarded with conspiracy theories and politics and, and the latest Trump tweet and those sorts of those have no place in a Shabbat service. We're disturbing the work that the Holy Spirit is trying to do. I don't have that flu that's going around, but <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from public places if I can. <laughs> but I do, my throat's still getting scratchy. <clears throat> so we have to create that, that spiritual comfort zone for community. And for some, the only community they have might be online. It might be meeting with people just like this in a Torah study once a week. That might be all that they have. So they're waiting on the Holy Spirit to add to their numbers. Uh, and they may have to travel for a while. It might be uncomfortable. I mean, if you think what it cost in our dollars or shillings or uh, pounds or whatever it is we have, if we had to stop our job, I'm going to, let's say conservatively, it would take them two weeks to travel to Jerusalem to observe Pesach or Sukkot or Shavuot. You got to travel. You may or may not have your own donkey. You've got to prepare to go. And you're not going to be able to stop at Burger King on the way. You truly have to prepare for two weeks at least, maybe three, in order to accomplish that journey probably on foot and to get back home. You have to think about each of those days. Well, where will I purchase my food? Or how much food can I carry? I'm not going to be working for three weeks, so that's three weeks worth of income I'm losing, which I guess the good I the good news would be back then, your boss is more likely to let you go for three weeks <laughs> to observe Passover. Um, those aren't the conversations we enjoy having today. It's like, sorry, I got to be off two weeks in October. What for? Sukkot? <laughs> Who? <laughs> your boss may not be that friendly. But in Israel, at least you could get those weeks. So add up all the weeks it's going to take you just to observe three feasts in Jerusalem. Add up all the income you're going to lose over those weeks. 
Now, in terms of our dollars or our pounds or our shillings, what would that cost us? What would it cost you on your job? What would be one week's salary on your job? Right? Just go ahead and fill that in there. Now multiply it times three, because you can probably figure a minimum of three weeks off the job for each feast, unless you live right there in Jerusalem, which not everybody did. Now multiply that times two. Maybe not so much time for Shavuot, because you're only going to be there a couple of days. But while you're there, maybe you will stay the week. So add another week of income. And all of a sudden, now we can identify with the tribulation that they had to go through just to honor the Torah, just to gather with like kind and like mind at the appointed times. Was it convenient? Not by any means. It was not convenient at all. But it was expected to be a joy. In spite of its inconvenience, in spite of the stress of leaving all your sheep back there or, you know, maybe your aging parents who were too old to make the trip. Think of all the things that wouldn't get done, because I think about that, just getting ready for Sukkot. Think, oh my goodness, the mail's going to be piling up and then I've got to have all this bookkeeping to do when I get back, and it'll take me forever to, to catch up on this. And so it kind of sours you a little bit to even take that time off. But he still wants you to be joyful, to understand the point. He says, I'm going to take care of whatever it is you're afraid you're losing by keeping my Shabbats, by keeping my Moedim. But above all, don't separate yourself from the community. That's a death flight, like we said for that seagull in Arizona. We don't want to be on a death flight. And so I said, why is this so important? Um, it goes back, it says, to Exodus 2.12. And if you want to jot that down, as it relates to um, number seven on page eight, because it's where you had to fill in which of those things on the wicked lamp worked against the Holy Spirit. So on number seven, you would have answered that separating brothers is what rebels against the reverence of Adonai. What is disrespect to Adonai? Separating his people when they should be together. We're not even talking about his enemies. They don't even play in this equation. In fact, the beginning of Revelation, the nations really don't play into the equation. He's talking to people who should know about the feast and the Shabbat. He's cleaning his own house first. So with Exodus 2.12, it says that... Um, Moses left the palace of Pharaoh and saw how the Israelites were enslaved. And the quotation from 2.12 is, he gave his heart to feel their distress. What is this first connection that Moses feels to Israel, even though he's 40 years away from actually returning to function as the messenger of salvation, what is the first little click in his heart where he identifies with that community? Where's the first sign you get in Moses that he identifies with that congregation? And he says, I'm a part of them. I may not look like them. I might be dressed up like an Egyptian. And they're dressed up like slaves. <laughs> I don't know if they're dressed up. They're probably dressed down. But I identify no matter what I look like. I identify with these sweaty, stinky, hungry, depressed, oppressed people. I identify with the most humbled people now on the face of the earth. Remember their heritage. They have this huge heritage handed down to them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Judah, Joseph, wonderful blessings. That's the last thing we get out of the book of Genesis is how blessed they're going to be or basically what's going to befall you at the end of days, but a wonderful heritage back there of true nobility because Abraham and Sarah look at, I mean, they had lavish gifts placed upon them by Pharaoh when they left Egypt. They were like a prince and a princess. That was their heritage. They received deference from Pharaoh and from Avimelech because of their high position within as Hebrews. And then in a generation, being Hebrew is no longer considered royalty, nobility. The name changes. But Moses, in spite of his high station, but see, no matter how you go as an Enosh, it still doesn't make you Adam. It still doesn't make you a spiritual, yearning human being. So all the riches of Egypt you could be dressed in and enjoying, and nevertheless, that slave would be higher than you. If that slave had retained his spiritual identity as a son or a daughter of Abraham. Not just the identity, but in the behavior. Because behavior, what you're doing, reflects what's cut into your heart, what has been devised in there. And so it says there that Moses gave his heart to feel their distress. So the place where either good or bad is cut in your heart, and remember, that's central on this lamp. All right, that's the fourth abomination. So just like the Ruach Adonai, which means governing and authority on the holy lamp, what is the governing authority of the wicked lamp? Whatever's cut into your heart, those pathways that you've cut into stone over time because you traveled them over and over and over, that's why your feet naturally run to evil because the path is worn down. They, your feet know exactly where to go to get there. You've just run there so often, it's the short path. <laughs> it's the easiest path. And it actually becomes harder to take a path of righteousness. Because what are you doing? At least for you, you're having to cut a new path. And so at that point, we see that Moses' heart, we don't know if it's changing but definitely right there, something is cutting on his heart. And what cuts in there is he feels their distress. And he feels that identification with them as part of me. That's why when we minister to the homeless, we minister to the widow, we minister to the orphan, we minister to that person in our congregation who's fallen on hard times, maybe through sickness or, you know, unpredictable financial reversal, any number of things can happen to people. And if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. And so when we look at their distress, we don't sit back and say, well, they just should have been better money managers. You know, or it was just in their genes, they were bound to get cancer, you know, runs in the family. Well, they're orphans, but they've got people to take them in, you know, or God will take care of them. Yeah. And who's God's hand? Who's making his name for him with their behavior? So Moses didn't just sit back and say, you know what? Their parents should have put them in baskets in the Nile. They wouldn't be in that situation. <laughs> He knows somehow that no matter what wonderful things he has, those are the people I identify with. That's my group. They got a lot of problems. In fact, the rabbis say they had fallen to the 39th level of sin. And one more level and they would have been irretrievable. And we know that they carried a lot of Egypt out with them, the golden calf. 
all sorts of bitterness they carried out with them. So were they perfect? No, they were far from perfect. They were playing with idolatry. They were rebellious. They were complainers. They were usurpers of authority. They were self-glorifiers. Go down the list of all the things you shouldn't be in order to bring glory to the name, and they were all that, just like we are. Nevertheless, Moses says, I identify with those people. Why? It says he gave his heart to feel their distress. And that's why you don't separate yourself from the community. Sometimes we get sick of the distress within the community, and that's why we separate ourselves. Moses was already separated, and instead of backing away further and saying, gee, I'm glad I took the boat ride down the Nile, instead he takes a step closer to the most miserable human beings he's probably ever encountered and said, those are my people. In fact, that's what Ruth did. She goes back and she says, these are my people. And the famine is turning around. In fact, the, the Midrash says that the reason that Naomi's husband and two sons died is because they left Bethlehem in a time of distress and in a time of famine. That is the absolute worst time to leave your community when it's in a time of stress. And therefore, he took their lives. And it says here in the commentary on this, it says one of the prerequisites to acquire the Torah is to share your neighbor's yoke. In other words, whatever distress you see your neighbor going through, you share that yoke. Just like Moses saw the distress that the Israelites were going through, and he may have done it impetuously and murderously, but he did something. He identified with their distress, and he did what he did to try to alleviate the distress on these slaves. Now, as it turned out, it was not the right thing to do. It, it cost him about 40 years on the backside of the wilderness, and we tend to do that when we get into Torah. Uh, we tend to cut people to pieces, and we get put in time out until we grow up a little bit and learn how to tend sheep instead of, you know, put on the armor and just start swinging the sword. But that's the turning point for Moses. He gave his heart to feel their distress. He did not turn away from the distress of those of like kind and like mind. And it's not considered truly loving your neighbor unless you were willing to also share in that neighbor's suffering. And when you're willing to share in that neighbor's suffering, what happens? You build your name. Just like Shemot, names. You take a conspicuous position. You don't fade away. Oh, where's Moses? I don't know, probably in, <laughs> I don't know, his boat on the Nile getting a massage. That's not what happened. He didn't fade back into anonymity he takes a step, he identifies with the tribulation and the distress of his people, and he begins to earn that conspicuous position. He starts to build a name. And now his name is a metaphor for the first five books of the Bible. So we can take some faulty steps, but we don't quit stepping. We continue to identify with other people's distress. So he walks up on this well in the wilderness, and these seven sisters talk about paleo prophecy. I mean, Zipporah gives his sons a circumcision without a man's hand. Paleo prophetic of the Holy Spirit, a circumcision without a man's hand. Why? Because a woman did it. She did his job. Beautiful prophecies. And so 
He could have watched the interaction with the evil shepherds against the seven sisters, and he doesn't. He steps in again, and he gives his heart to share in their suffering and in their distress, and he stands in there and relieves the suffering, not just of the sisters, but of the sheep they're, they're tending. Because, see, when the evil shepherds drove away the shepherdesses, it meant that their sheep went thirsty. So Moses steps in there and, again, gives his heart. He's cutting new places into his heart, and those places that he's cutting in there are a sense of responsibility toward a community that he's not even developed yet. I mean, the first time you meet these seven sisters, it doesn't make you a congregation. It doesn't make you a family. But he knew his own kind. The same thing with defending the slaves. He didn't hang out with those people, but he defended his own kind. And then when he returns eventually, he will be hanging out with those people. He will be leading those people because he was willing to associate himself with them in their distress. And that's what the rabbis conclude about this particular Mishnah. They say the teaching of this Mishnah is that we must not isolate ourselves when the community is under stress. We must participate with the community even when we have the means to live in greater comfort. And, you know, I'd never, I had read that Mishnah before, but I'd never really investigated the passage that it was based on. But that's important, and, and I'm glad that we read that, because it really shed light for me on what's going on in the Torah portion Shemot, as well as the separation caused by the wicked lamp. Um, so let's skip a little bit. We're running out of time now. So we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left. But let's go over to page 9 because we skipped this before. And it's too valuable to leave behind. Because in order for us to build our name, our names, our Shemot, um, yeah, I think it is Exodus 2.12. If it's not, let me know and we'll look it up on Blue Letter right quick. Um, but there's two things that are going to help us try to discern, am I working... Am I walking the path of the wicked lamp? Let's just call it a path, because we know walking in the Spirit is also a path. There's a path of righteousness that's based on my walking in the seven spirits of Adonai, walking in wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and reverence. There's another path I can go down that's based on pride, based on lies, um, based on innocent blood, based on my feet going to the wrong places and the wrong people, based on my losing the ability to tell the difference between a truth and a lie so that I become a false witness. And in many cases, you talk to those people, they don't even know they're lying. And you can tell them that, like, you do not even know uh, that you're lying. Uh, Denial. I was trying to think of the word. <laughs> That's how you remember the word denial. It stands for don't even know I'm lying. <laughs> but you kind of have to, you know, stretch it a little bit to make it fit. But that's it. I mean, if you could just, with a snap of the fingers, when a suspect has his first police interview, Statistically, how many of them admit the first time they're asked that they did it? <laughs> you 
you know, you probably only need one hand for that number, right? So we do. We tend to either misremember things that might be damaging to us, or we get into such a habit of lying that we don't even know when we're lying anymore. That's when we have actually become that false witness, breathing out lies. So there's two truths, speaking of prisons, that I learned from an old con. I mean, this guy had maybe one tooth in his head, and they gave him dentures, and he still wouldn't wear them. But as old as he was, he was very wise in the way of people because that's how he made his living. He was cunning, but not with the spirit of wisdom. It was like the cunning of the snake, very clever. And he made his living off of running cons on people. And he taught me cons. It's interesting what you can learn from mafiosos and common street thugs, but you pick up a few skills. And he said, every single con I ever ran was based on two premises. Number one, human beings don't like to look powerless or dumb in front of other human beings. Why is that? Because people want to look smart and powerful in front of other human beings. So he just took the negative part of that. What is that? That's the enosh reaction. It's a very mortal way of thinking, just like an animal. We don't see other people and give our heart to their distress. We see other people and see opportunities to build our little kingdom to take their problems and somehow enrich ourselves off of them, um, which is why you've got so many rules in the Torah about lending to the poor and so forth. You don't take advantage of them when they're in a bad place. Why? Because the enosh part of you says, this is my opportunity to make some money or to get more slaves or whatever. And the second principle was that human beings are innately greedy, which is connected to the first one. And what they want to do is they want to acquire more goods, more power, or knowledge. See, knowledge is also a currency. Especially in our day, we are in the information age. And the more information or skill, technological skill you have, the greater your market value in terms of finding a job. So it's not just money that makes us powerful. It's not just possessions that make us powerful. Sometimes it's the knowledge in our heads that gives us power over other people. And so he said human beings want those things, but they want to expend the least amount of effort to acquire it. And in fact, they would rather expend no effort in order to acquire it. He said, how do you think I sold Rolex watches for 25 bucks out of the back of my trunk for so many years? They want to look slick and powerful like they can afford a $4,000 watch. But the truth is, it's a knockoff. I paid 10, they'll pay 25. Because why? They don't want to expend the effort or the money for a $4,000 watch. They just want you to think they did. But human beings are lazy, he said. And if you can play off of that human laziness, or you can figure out a way that if they don't do what you want them to do, they're going to look stupid in front of their friends, or they're going to look powerful, any con will work. He, ta he taught me the short change how that works. Well, you don't ever pull the short change when you're the only customer in the gas station. You pull the short change when you see the cars pile up and the lines back to the door. That's when you pull the short change because the clerk has all these people lined up. She feels the pressure. She feels the eyes on her. And if she ever takes her hand off of that bill, it's mine. I just made $100 on the short change. Why? Because she doesn't want to look dumb 
were uncertain in front of all these people. Rather than count her money and think of the process like she should, she thinks more about the disapproval of the people standing in line behind him. So he manipulates her or him. And he said, I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars I made on Christmas money every year just making the circuit around Knoxville that way. All I had to do was watch the traffic and figure out the exact time to roll in there and get her to change a hundred dollar bill for me or him. Why? Because she doesn't want to look dumb. She doesn't want to look uncertain. And those are the ways typically that we will avoid the suffering that is necessary to acquire that extra oil for the holy lamp inside of us. That oil, extra oil anyway, is only acquired through suffering. You have to be crushed. So what does that mean? According to what this old convict taught me, what does that mean? Sometimes I'm going to look dumb and I'm going to look powerless in front of other human beings. I'm not going to like it. Isn't that what it said about Yeshua? He despised the shame. He despised it. He didn't like it any better than we did, but he put up with it. Why? Because he had to go through that tribulation to express the love so he could attach his heart like Moses to the distress of his people that he would one day save. The same thing with Yeshua. He was attaching his heart to the distress of the people that he came to save. In order to save those people, he knew he would have to look dumb and powerless and suffer shame in front of other human beings. When he was smarter and more powerful and more honorable than anybody that ever spoke to him. And he chose the harder path. And just like the other kind, I want to expend the least amount of effort to get the greatest result and make you think that I'm, I've got all this stuff. Or I literally want the stuff. You know, that's why people play the lottery. It's easier to shell out a few bucks each week in view of a great payoff that I didn't work for. It's much harder to go to work every week at a job you may not like and suffer the distress of working with people who are heathens or mean or whatever, or ladder climbers or backstabbers, it's easier to just, I'm going to win the lottery than to go put in that work and to suffer that distress. Why? But if you're a good father, or in some cases, if you're a good mother, you have attached your heart to your family. And the distress that you would put them through if you didn't get up and go work that nasty job every day. You don't want to put them through that. And that's what Judah said to Joseph about Jacob. Let me take Benjamin's place. He said, I can't bear to see the distress my father would go through. Why? He's attached his heart to his father now, whereas he hadn't before. What does he realize that will cost him? his life. He's going to look powerless in front of other people. He's going to look dumb because it's his idea to take Benjamin and guarantee him. He's going to lose all his wealth. He's going to lose all his goods. He's going to lose his name because he's got a good name as a Hebrew, as a son of Jacob, as a son of Israel. He's willing to forfeit everything, all his goods, all his power, all his knowledge, anything he has of value, he's ready to forfeit it because he cannot bear to see the distress of his people. And so when we get that, then we have what Yeshua had and what Moses had. We have a heart for our community. We don't leave our community in the time of their distress. That's when it's most important for us to agree to look dumb 
in other front of other people it's most important for us to feel powerless in front of other people it's most important for us to forego our own riches when others have none for us to forego our own power and use whatever power we have to help others who are powerless, like the widow or the orphan, or just that intellectually or socially challenged person, and you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> they just don't get it. You know, they're awkward socially, and they do say rude things, thoughtless things, things that they don't make you feel good. And you could show them how dumb they were. But when he gives you power, he wants you to become weak. That's what Yeshua did. That's the pattern we have. And you can't say, yes, I will walk this walk, but I'm only going to expend the least amount of personal effort in order to obtain the crown of the Torah. No, it'll actually cost you everything you have. You are going to realize you're not the smartest one in the room. You're not the most powerful one in the room. You are not of the greatest value in the room. In fact, your value is actually rising the more you devalue yourself. And that's the interplay of the Adam, the spiritual man, the Ish, which is the average guy, the intermediate, and then the Enosh, who's only concerned with mortal things. The one who is only interested in looking smart and powerful in front of other people, that's Enosh. That's the lowest human being you can possibly be. Because your power and your honor in front of other people is going to be eaten up by worms. We read that scripture last night. It's the king of Babylon, the one who was so lofty and high, the one who had everything in the world. And it says people are going to walk by and be like, is this the person we were afraid of? Are these mortal things that are going to be eaten up by worms, that rust is going to rot out, that moths are going to eat up, that's going to melt with a fervent heat someday? Are these the things we really want? Or do we want to forfeit the things that the Enosh man yearns after and say, look, I'm just an Ish. I'm intermediate right now, and I could go either way every day of the week. I could sink to the level of my mortality and only think about today. Or every day I can rise heavenward, and I can put my mind on heavenly things and on spiritual things. And the irony there is that the worms that eat the Enosh, the mortal man, Rimon, they're worms, but the word means lofty and high. Hmm? Well, that's how it reverses. See, in the kingdom of heaven, that which was considered lofty and high by mortal man sinks to the lowest level. But those who humbled themselves in order to attach their hearts to the distress of their own kind, those are the ones who turn out to be Adam, to be that elevated, and that's, it's interesting, that's what it says in the Mishnah. There is one area in which Adam is permitted to have pride. And I thought, what? Because we know he cannot dwell with a proud person. In what area could we ever be permitted pride? It says because the Adam knows that sin is beneath him. It's not who he is. And because of that pride, he will not stoop to the level of sin. He has no identification with that. That's the only place where it's permitted 
for you to make that value judgment. So you're not permitted to make yourself better or worse than other people. That's why I hate this overloaded sense of competition that we have in the United States. It's more about winning than the fellowship that it could be, which I think women are probably, you know, if, if dad brings little Joey back from the soccer game, um, you know, the first thing granddaddy wants to know is who won, but the first thing grandma wants to know is did everybody get to play? And I think that's where the spiritual, you know, the, the symbolism of the female, of the woman, having the more spiritual interest in the relationship. And we know Moses was nurtured by three women. It doesn't really acknowledge his father at all, other than I'm sure he was a participant, but we have Yocheved, his mother, who hid him for three months. We have Miriam, who risked her life to escort that basket and watch that basket while it was on the Nile, and then offers a wet nurse, which is going to tell Pharaoh's daughter that somebody related to me, and then Pharaoh's daughter defying her father's decree and protecting an Israelite Hebrew boy. Three women. He has that influence that represents the Holy Spirit working in his life to the point that when he is 40 years old, that he can attach his heart to his people, that he can start that journey up to Adam instead of descending to that level of Enosh. And I guess I better stop the recording there so I don't run out our data.